Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, let me welcome you to the second day of the International Conference on Education, Sustainability and Inclusive Development, which uh, started yesterday, is organized by the Center for Sustainable Development Studies of the University of Amsterdam in collaboration with its partners at the Amsterdam Sustainability Institute, the Institute for Social Studies in The Hague, IHE Delft for Water Education, Urban Studies. So my name is Marta Bavink, uh, I'm co-director of CSCS, and I'm acting as the host uh, of this conference. We're passing uh, the, the word to Mika to start the plenary. One thing about this afternoon, so we'll be having another, another plenary session this afternoon at 4.30 European time. And that session will basically be uh, discussing some of the lessons of this conference with deans and directors of educational institutes in the Netherlands uh, in their teaching. So how do they expect to take some of the things which we have been discussing today and yesterday forward in our teaching programs? We will also have a, a, a performance by a performance artist named Kiki Schippers, but you'll hear more about that uh, this afternoon. So let me now uh, uh, hand the floor to Mika Lopez uh, Cardoso, who is chairing this second plenary session. Go ahead, Mika. Okay, my name is Mika Lopez Cardoso. I'm senior lecturer at the University of Amsterdam in education and inclusive development and delighted to be opening this content focused plenary session of today um, with a leading scholar in the field of education and uh, international development, providing us with hopefully a thought provoking keynote speech, which I'm sure that uh, he will. So Professor Mario Novelli, who is a professor in um, political economy of education at the University of Sussex. He will speak for about 20 minutes and then we have three discussions. We have Fiona Dove, who is executive director of the Transnational Institute. We have Cornelius Hacking, senior policy advisor of the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And Arjen Wals, who is professor of transformative learning for social ecological sustainability at Wageningen University and UNESCO chair for social learning for sustainability. So I'm delighted to have all these speakers here this morning. And without further ado, I would like to hand the floor to Mario. Uh, um, before we begin, I just want to say thank you to, to Martin, to Mika, to the University of Amsterdam for uh, this uh, very kind invitation. Um, I've only got 20 minutes. I'm going to put my clock on so that I don't abuse my time. Um, and I'm going to rush through the PowerPoint. Um, I'm going to rush through the presentation. Um, but uh, if people want more of the detail, um, I've shared already a, a, a paper, um, which I'm happy for uh, the organizers to, to pass on uh, to anyone that's interested. Um, so what I want to do um, today is really kind of um, look beneath the field of international education and development and try and explore some of the blind spots, some of the challenges um, and locate education more broadly inside the field of international uh, development and start to ask and raise some questions, which I hope that the discussants can, in, can engage with. Um, you know, having said that, it's it's really a strange time um, to be giving a keynote at a conference. Um, I think the COVID-19 pandemic has really transformed uh, our rituals in so many different ways. Um, online digital interactions have become increasingly the norm. And it's also a strange time to talk about education, which for me, I've always felt kind of marginalized. Uh, because of having such a great interest in, in education. But recently, I think it's come into center stage for so many people. The last 12 months have really raised the level of importance of education as schools have been closed around the world. Parents have suddenly realized what it's like to educate their children at home. Um, and a whole range of issues around inequalities, 
are related to who has access to online digital resources, who doesn't, who goes to private schools, who goes to public schools, what kind of uh, learning loss is taking place. And I think beyond that, um, and certainly uh, this is a strong debate in the UK at the moment, uh, there's a recognition that schooling is not only about curriculum learning, that when you take schooling away from, from students and, and children, you're not just taking away those curriculum items uh, that are later tested in, in exams, but you're all also testing a whole, you're taking away a whole field of issues around food, social welfare, uh, inclusion, social relations, a whole uh, set of processes that education and schooling uh, are implicated in. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, at least this period for us that work on education international development, it's been interesting to see education somewhat move to centre stage. And so I think it's a good chance for us um, to then uh, start raising questions about the nature of the field. Um, could we move to the next slide? Um, so, you know, this conference is about uh, SDGs for education um, and uh, the SDGs for education. I'm just going to briefly run through them. I won't go into any great detail uh, about them today, but I just want to uh, really start uh, by just reflecting on some of the some of the goals. So in, in essentially, I, I won't say the 2030, but that's the kind of target. These targets tend to get moved as we go along. Uh, all girls and boys complete free, equitable and quality primary and secondary education. Girls and boys have access to quality early childhood development, equal access for women and men to affordable and quality technical vocational education, increase the number of youth and adults who have rele relevant skills for employment, eliminate disparities, both gender, disabilities, uh, related to ethnicity, religion, etc. Uh, all youth uh, and a substantial portion of adults uh, achieve literacy and numeracy. Uh, all learners acquire knowledge and skills to promote sustainable development, including, among others, through uh, human rights, gender equality, promotion of a culture of peace, etc. Uh, improve the infrastructure uh, um, of education systems around the world. Um, and uh, expand the number of scholarships and finally increase the supply of teachers. Now, for much of education research in our field, which often follows funding priorities set by these social development goals, sustainable development goals, the question often then becomes how? How do we reach these targets? What are the mechanisms? And it often becomes a technical issue around the funding mechanisms, the best policies and strategies. That is to say that it becomes a technical issue. In this process of making it a technical issue, we have an expression of what Ferguson famously called development as being a kind of anti-politics machine, where it makes blatantly political decisions about the allocation of resources appear to be technical solutions to technical problems. And what I want to do today is instead repoliticize the education development debate and make a case that what I will call big D development is part of the problem rather than the solution and needs to radically confront itself. If it is to contribute to a more utopian aspirations of its advocates rather than the rather dystopian aspirations of some of its architects. Um, now, some of these issues are unique to, into, to education, but also um, some are more broader. Um, could we move to the next slide? Now, this is also a period where I think the development industry is facing a crisis of legitimacy that comes from both the political left and the political right uh, and spans a variety of areas. And I'm, um, I've, I've listed some that I'll briefly go through, um, but I'm sure that the audience could add uh, many more. Um, the first thing I think is that in Western countries, the post 2008 austerity period has led to many populations, many uh, uh, media outlets, starting to raise the question of why is it that the West gives money to the global South? Um, 
when budgets are so tight in our own countries. Um, there's a question then of efficiency, which is also a critique of whether the money, if we agree to send that money uh, outside of our own country, is well used and does what it says it will. There's also been issues around morality of the international development uh, uh, community. And, you know, increasingly um, this is focused around the fact that the West has increased money directed towards refugees to ensure that they remain on the borders of the countries that they originated from and not end up in Western Europe or North America. Uh, so there has been a critique around the way that aid has been used. There's also been a question of the morality of the humanity of international development assistance, a range of scandals involving uh, sex scandals, corruption within the field of international development that have started to put a spotlight on the nature of the relationships between North and South that manifest themselves through the development regime. There have also been questions, particularly since 9-11, around securitization of aid, the way aid has been used for geopolitical and uh, geostrategic reasons uh, and often not directed towards those most in need. Uh, a long-standing one has been an economic critique. Um, the aid now is, not, is being used to bolster not the economy of the recipient, but the sender, the donor a way of oiling trade deals, facilitating contracts for national companies. Um, the UK seems to be leading the way in this bit, bad practice on this, as it seeks to use soft money to lubricate trade deals in the post-Brexit era. But structurally, we can see this in the merging of trade and development sections of, national, of, of, the, of nation states. For example, um, the shift to create the creation of the Minister for Foreign Trade and Development Cooperation in the Netherlands, Canada's Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development, and more recently the integration of DIFID, the Department for International Development in the UK, uh, into uh, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Um, this year and over the last four or five years, there's also been a very strong decolonial critique uh, growing across, uh, across the world concerning the West's role in the impoverishment economically, culturally, politically, linguistically, intellectually of indigenous as other, the role of the West in slavery and calls for reparations. And the fact that aid often fo closely follows those colonial, those old colonial footprints. And finally, uh, there is a question around environmental sustainability. If countries in the global south develop at the same level and pace uh, as, as the global north, what is the future of sustainability of the planet? And is a big undevelopment process necessary rather than a development process? And if that's the case, who should pay for this? How would that manifest itself? Um, so if we move on now to the next slide, I think that uh, what I want to kind of go back to is when we talk about development, I think that uh, there are kind of two types of development and what Gillian Hart uh, um, uh, distinguishes between big D and small D development. So what she says is big D development, she defines as the multiply scale projects of intervention in the third world that emerged in the context of decolonization struggles and the Cold War. Little d development refers to the development of capitalism as geographically uneven, but spatially interconnected process of creation and destruction, dialectically interconnected with the discourses and practices. Now, I don't think these two are binaries, but there is a sense of a political project that emerged in the sec uh, after the Second World War, which argued for a particular type of international development. And so it's that area that I'm gonna focus on rather than the broader question of global capitalist development. Uh, could we move to the next slide? Um, and thinking through this uh, big D development, I think that uh, it's interesting to go back to when we teach in international development, we often uh, start in the kind of post-war period and often start with President Truman's 
uh, famous proclamation of point, uh, the Point Four Proclamation in 1948. And uh, in that he, he says, we must embark on a bold new program for making the benefits of our scientific advances and industrial progress available for the improvement and growth of undeveloped areas. I believe that we should make available to peace loving peoples the benefits of our store of knowledge. Uh, in order to help them realize their aspirations for a better life. The old imperialism exploitation for foreign profit has no place in our plans. What we envisage is a prog program of development based on concepts of democratic fair dealing. And I think that's a kind of upbeat understanding, although as uh, Arturo Escobar and uh, Hubert Rust uh, noted, it does kind of um, underpin a kind of uh, notion that the West is superior, that it can share its superior knowledge with, with the South, but nevertheless a fairly upbeat uh, message. At the same time, in the back rooms in the US, probably on the same day, we also have these documents emerging later uh, from George Kennan in the US State Department, where he says, we have about 50% of the world's wealth, but only 6% of its population. In this situation, we cannot fail to be the object of envy and resentment. Our real task in this coming period is to devise a pattern of relationships will permit us to maintain this position of disparity. To do so, we will have to dispense with all sentimentality and daydreaming, and our attention will have to be concentrated everywhere on our immediate national objectives. We should cease to talk about vague and unreal objectives such as human rights, the raising of living standards and democratization. There you have a much more real politic understanding of this uh, North-South relationship. And I think that those two kind of images are kind of benign, but quite paternalistic, uh, quite Western-centric understanding and a more brutal kind of uh, logical uh, um, reproduction or with the aim of reproducing inequality, um, in a sense, permeate our field. And I think that, you know, at different times and different periods, these move in different directions. Could we move uh, to the next um, uh, question? So similarly, uh, I think that for many, there is a recognition that there is a continuity between colonialism and development. And I think it's important to grapple with that, to understand the way development for many uh, critics is a continuation by other means of a broader and longer process of Northern and Western domination of the global South. And uh, uh, Umu Qatari uh, uh, notes that uh, an apt quote from Cecil Rhodes, old colonialist, Inter interestingly puts this sort of assumptions in perspective. He argued that imperialism was philanthropy plus a 5% dividend on investment. And she argues that we need to be wary of histories of development that deny this colonial genealogy and attempt to create distinct and artificial boundaries between the exploitation of empire and the humanitarianism of development. So I think that it's important here um, to, re to at least recognize that whilst development does contain this utopian aspiration of the rest catching up with the West, it also has that push and pull of colonial legacies, imperial legacies, neo-imperial legacies that manifest themselves. Uh, could we move to the next stage? Next slide. Similarly, I think we need to reflect uh, on the fact that our own research uh, is itself penetrated by these tensions. Um, and uh, Mahmoud Mamdani, uh, well-known international political and development theorist, uh, in a recent keynote, uh, when we used to meet face to face in conferences uh, for the Development Studies Association said, development studies used to be a critique of empire but it has now become the language of empire. And I think that it's worth for us in academia to reflect on the way that we uh, have become increasingly dependent on international development funding from agencies. Uh, we have increasingly become or placed at the service of international development actors rather than the critiques of that process. And in, in a sense, uh, you know, 
while um, we of course have got our critical international uh, academics and institutions and we should remember in the history of development that while we have Samuel Huntington and uh, um, let's say the more state-centric uh, uh, academics uh, of this field, we also have our Samir Amin's and our Mahmoud Mandani's and our more radical institutions and similarly we have our international development uh, institutions but that in the last 20 years this development industry has really started to colonize the field of research and international development and uh, critique has been somewhat muted. Uh, next slide. Um, so I guess then moving on to education, I think that, you know, we have to recognize that education research is pushed and pulled uh, in a range of different directions and is subject to the same similar pushes. So if we go back to the colonial period, uh, and look at what the British saw as the role of education. Uh, there's a nice quote from Macaulay in 1835, who argues, we must at present do our best to form a class who may be interpreters between us and the millions we govern, a class of persons Indian in blood and color, but English in taste, in opinions, in morals, and in intellect. From the 60s onwards, when we moved into a post-colonial period, but still with those relationships of dependency, uh, human capital became the mechanism through which education was driven. And within this, the idea that education uh, was the uh, missing link in why North-South relations were unequal. And uh, Schultz argued that knowledge and skill are in great part the product of investment and combined with other human investments predominantly account for the productive superiority of the technically advanced countries. Not colonialism, not slavery, not imperial conquest, but differences in knowledge. And it's this kind of foundational myth that lives on within the field of education and international development, that um, the problems of international development are internal to those low income countries. Uh, and that uh, the solutions all come from the outside, from the West. Uh, so it's a very paternalistic, very Westocentric, very modernist kind of uh, type of education being promoted which negates all of those internal potential knowledges, alternative ways of doing and being uh, from the global south and the sense of responsibility that is placed internally rather in that relational uh, question of north-south relations. Um, next slide. Um, so um, if we think about this, um, those advocates, uh, Sorry, could we go back one slide? Um, just to say, those advocates of human capital theory often treated indigenous culture as a problem rather than a resource, saw Western education models as unproblematic solutions to Southern problems and were blind to the way the highly unequal global economy and polity might undermine national independence. Um, to paraphrase a recent findings of a recent study on education and conflict in the Maasai Kenya, modern schooling often takes away people from their communities, cultures and heritage and negates their traditional identities, knowledges and forms of dress and offers them a white collar dream of public jokes, which rarely materialise. Uh, next slide. And I'm, I'm, I'm coming to the end. Uh, don't panic. Uh, uh, colleagues that are chairing this. Um, now we could go through this and look at the way that the global education industry has developed but I think that there's a couple of things that, that, that are worth noting. One, the rise of neoliberalism since the 1970s has really transformed the terrain of education. Education now is not only in human capital terms at the service of the economy, but is itself an industry, an, an industry, a four trillion dollar industry that can be bought and sold on the marketplace. And so we have this situation. And I think that, you know, the whole ed tech revolution that we're going through with the post COVID, uh, with the COVID uh, crisis um, may lead to a new further uh, evolution of that. So can we move to the final uh, slide now? Uh, so just in conclusion, 
Um, I think that, uh, you know, in, on, a, on a kind of final positive take, I think that there are a range of things that we should work towards. And these are not easy and they'll take time and they'll involve a lot of people. But I do think that we have to move from a model of international development assistance as a kind of mode of charity to thinking about aid as reparations, to recognise the role of the of, of the global south in developing the global north, to recognise that industrial development damaged the environment and the planet and uh, um, the north developed on the backs of that. So this idea of um, international development as a benevolent gift should be reversed and we should think about maybe an international development fund uh, which could be used uh, to distribute resources rather than this highly politicised mechanism that we have now. Secondly, I think we need to move from a model of West modernization and westernization to an ecology of knowledges and voices. We need to diversify both the thinking and the voices and the presence and the actors within the field of international development. The third one is to try to protect education uh, um, as a com uh, um, to move away education as a commodity and to put it back in the public domain to ensure that education is protected from the vagaries of the market. Um, uh, the fourth thing we need to do is to think about schooling, not only as a mechanism to develop skills, to labour, but also for education, for freedom, emancipation and sustainability, to broaden out that curriculum, to broaden out the ambition. And finally, um, for researchers and colleagues in the room, I think we need to stop researching for big D development actors and to start much more research about them. And what I'm saying there is the call for observatories of international development practice, observers of international uh, policy development. Uh, we could start to develop much stronger uh, critique. And there's no greater need for this than in my own country. Uh, whose shifts in international development assistance over the recent years has been remarkable. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mario, for uh... Uh, these thought-provoking words for inviting us to rethink, observe, reobserve the paradigms that really underlie this field. So I hope this uh, gives us a good ground for um, our three discussants to provide their initial reflections. Um, they will be on screen soon and uh, they will all take a couple of minutes and to respond. The chat is also open to the audience to uh, provide your questions. I already saw a few questions coming in, but we will use the next um, 10 minutes or 12 minutes or so to um, engage with the discussants. Mario, you'll have a brief moment to reflect and then we'll also open up to questions from the audience um, for the latter part. So, um, I'm hoping that the discussions will come on screen soon. If you, um, if you have trouble accessing, you need to um, push the blue button, which will allow your video and screen. Fiona, welcome, good to see you. So I'll hand the floor to Fiona Dove, Executive Director of the Transnational Institute. Fiona. Thank you, Mika. And thank you, Mario, uh, for a very thought-provoking uh, keynote. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure where to enter. There's so much I agree with Mario um, that um, it was it was hard to find stuff that I could add. M my perspective is not as uh, as an educator in the formal sense. I think I, I work for the Transnational Institute, which uh, works more in the realm of public education and. Uh, a knowledge provision for social movement activists. So, so I'm coming from, from a very different perspective. Can you hear everyone? No, I don't hear anybody. Um, Put you around. Fiona. Okay. Um, so a few, a few comments that I thought, you know, just, just to, flesh out some of what, what 
I think the one is um, about the the kind of extractivist nature of the development model. So on the one on the one hand, it's ostensibly aid or, or charity, as uh, as Mario put it. Um, but on the other hand, it's also to facilitate extraction. So it's to facilitate markets, to facilitate labor, and it's an extraction of, of surplus value, of actual resources, and also often exporting the profits. So very, very, so you give with one hand and you take away with the other. One, one of the, the issues we've been trying to put on the global agenda uh, in, in light of questions of austerity and investment in education and, and so forth, is this little talked about still in, in the public domain, um, a facility of investor state dispute mechanisms. Um, so just very quickly, it's quite a complex area, but basically these are private arbitration courts where companies, usually big multinationals, can take states to a private court, so they, they go around uh, national judicial systems, uh, to get compensation when they feel that actions by a national state have interfered with their expected or anticipated future profits. So this can be cases, you know, often cases that we tend to highlight tend to be the ones where states have taken actions in the public interest. So uh, tobacco advertising, phasing out coal or nuclear nuclear power. Um, and then those companies demand compensation because they say that they've invested in infrastructure and, and in the business, and now that's been taken away from them. And they sue states, often southern states. And by the way, the Netherlands is a big source of these cases because of, of investment treaties um, and also uh, uh, tax treaties that allow companies to register here as, as kind of mailbox companies. So the Netherlands is, is a huge source of these, these cases. And these states are sued for billions. Uh, and we were mapping a couple of years ago, we were looking at the cases in Africa because Africa is still a bit new um, on the ISDS front, but there were 106 cases. And we looked, there were 61 that had been settled at that point. Um, and they amount to, you know, the, the, the cost of the, of the settlements which doesn't include, by the way, all the legal costs. So if you lose a case as a state, which invariably you do, you end up um, not only paying the, the compensation, but you also have to pay the legal fees of the multinational and your own legal fees, and it amounts to billions. Um, and we were calculating that it was the equivalent of, of the annual aid received by Ethiopia, for example. So. And then, then you've got increased sovereign debt, and then um, you've got structural adjustment required, austerity, and then disinvestment from education, and a whole vicious downward spiral. So it's just to say that, you know, we talk about loans and debt, but there's also this ISDS question, which, which really has to be put much more centrally uh, on the agenda, because this, this is a, an architecture that has to be undone because it's, um, this, this is really very counterproductive for, for any efforts of development. Um, so that, that was one, one additional thing I wanted to, to raise. Um, perhaps the other is this whole question, Mario did, did talk about it, but uh, what Corona is showing us is the importance of digital infrastructure as a public uh, service and digital access as a public good. So I think that's that's something that we've got to really update our, our sense of things now. Uh, and Corona has thrown this into, into very sharp relief. Um, the extent to which, um, you know, the, the inequality um, is being um, exposed through, through lack of access to, to digital infrastructure in most parts of the South, but also I think in, in many poorer parts of the North um, a lot of people don't, a lot of children don't have computers and parents can't afford uh, the internet access. And in South Africa, the country that I grew up in, uh, you pay for data. So it's extremely expensive for, for everyone, but especially for, for children of poorer families to, to afford uh, internet access. So you're seeing an enormous digital poverty um, phenomenon um, emerging. And there were calls, I remember Jeremy Corbyn, and I think even in the US there were calls for uh, for nationalization of digital infrastructure, and everyone thought they were complete loonies. 
but I think this is now something that is firmly on the agenda that, uh, that um, yeah, it, it is an essential um, infrastructure that, that uh, has, to, has to be in public hands and be uh, equi equitably distributed. So that was my second point was about, about the, the digital dimension to education mm -hmm. and the importance of infrastructure. I think the third thing was the gender dimension. When you look at the SDGs, they all framed in gender terms. Uh, so I was kind of interested that Mario didn't mention gender at all. Um, so I think that's something something to also look at is the um, yeah the the gendered nature not only of education but also what happens when people come out of those educational systems and and into the labour market or into society. Um, there's there, there's a strong yeah, gender is something that that is uh, circumscribes all social relations, and I think again in Corona, you 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 hear talk now about a kind of return to the fifties, mm. uh, and that's very much within the liberal frame. But uh, a sense that how quickly in in this kind of war situations, war footing that we're on, that uh, that care of of education and care of children have very quickly reverted to to the home and it tends to put women back into that, what was called the triple shift. So the double shift, the work, uh, care of the children, but also the emotional labor that goes uh, into sustaining um, home life. Um, and if you're a working class woman, of course, that's even more difficult and particularly working class women who are unable to work at home, that this has become an intolerable situation. So I think it just highlights the very gendered nature of, um, um of of the the considerations around education and also preschool and childcare because we we uh, we tend to think of education only in terms of schools and and universities or technical schools uh, but the childcare dimension is also very important and and that's there's a preschool yeah. aspect to that but there's also an aspect that frees up a uh, woman to be able to enter paid work <clears throat> or do whatever it is they want to do um, so the, the gender dimension, I think, is something more to explore. And then my final point, and I hope I'm not taking too long. Please, uh, please is, keep it short, uh, Fiona, the, the final point. Okay. Thank you. No, it, it, is, a, it is to reinforce what, um, what Mario said about the need to, to look at development, perhaps to focus less on the problem of the South or the problems of the South and focus it more on the destructive nature of the projects of the North. So we change the focus of development from the South to the North. To some extent, the SDGs are actually going in that direction because they apply both North and South. Uh, but I think this is something very serious we have to look at because there's a lot of unlearning to be done and a big project that needs to be um, undone. Mm. Um, and we have to move, I think, to post-development paradigm um, and I think this is precisely what this conference actually is doing when I looked at the program it's pretty amazing and I think it is the kind of rethinking of what it means to be uh, living in a world that is under enormous ecological pressure that has a, a burden of inequality that is going to produce societies that are so highly securitized by those who have things to lose that um, this is going to become a very unlivable planet unless we completely turn this thing on its head. So those, those are my comments. And I'm sorry I took a little longer than I intended. Thank you, Fiona. These are very valuable comments. So um, I will hand it over now to uh, Professor Arjen Walls. And um, I hope that our colleague Cornelius will also be able to enter in um, after that. Arjen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mika. And thank you, Mario. And I will Fiona. unmute you just one second. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Mika, and thank you, Mario and Fiona, for a very provocative uh, uh, start of this day. Um, yeah, there's a, it's very rich, the conversation, and uh, uh, what to add. So I'll try to, to, to add a few things um, um, still, I hope. Uh, for one, I do think that the, the SDGs um, do provide a mechanism to kind of disrupt this, the global systemic dysfunction that we are I think all talking about 
at the same time, uh, and I also hear Fiona and, and Mario say this, we need to be critical of, of the way sustainable development continues to be used. I mean, the question is not, it's not about how do we sustain uh, development, which, you know, is often the problem. The question is not so much, uh, you know, maybe we need to ask what is it that needs to be sustained and what is it that needs to be disrupted? Both are equally important, I think. And there's a lot of focus at the moment uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, there's a climate adaptation summit. You know, how do we adapt to these inevitable changes that are uh, coming and that we're already part of? And some people are far more a part of it than we are at the moment. And we must recognize that too. And it may be not so much a, a question of adaptive capacity building, but much more of disruptive capacity building. Um, and, and this is something, uh, in some ways, the sustainable development uh, goals kind of detract from that disruptive side. I mean, when we have uh, SDG 8, decent work and economic growth, uh, that's a classic example. Who, who got growth in there? Why is it not a decent work and a circular economy, for instance, um, or a more distributive economy focusing on regeneration? So, and it's same as, you know, people won't object to uh, eradicating extreme uh, poverty or poverty, period. But if it would be eradicating extreme wealth, there would be a lot of opposition. So we need to be very critical of how these SDGs are used. Another disadvantage that we might see, and I see this in universities, is that we start seeing them as kind of reductionism 3.0 where we start checking the different SDGs and how they are manifested in different courses and it becomes a kind of check in the box uh, exercise. Um, if we are to look at SDG 4, education, I would say uh, yes. we really need to see, see it. We really need to see yeah. it as, okay. as one of the process processes that can help realize all the other SDGs along with say SDG 7. Yes, I hear you now. Sort yeah. of goals and, um, nice to have you there, Cornelius. And it is nice to have, um, um, I think it's the key about sustainability is that we learn to live more holistically, more relationally, and that the, maybe the rational university becomes a relational university, and maybe not even a university, but a pluriversity, where there's far more room and space for multiple ways of being and knowing in the world. And we, and that, that has to do with all these things that have been mentioned already, decolonization, moving away from this extractivist way of looking at how we uh, connect uh, with the earth. Um, it is also um, has to do with finding, uh, you know, and I think this is maybe a key point for our universities. How do we engage with all these niches and movements that seek to transition away from these extractivist ways of, of exploitative ways of connecting with the world, connecting with people far away, connecting with other species. You know, we have an earthing crisis. It's an existential crisis. And people, a lot of young people that, that I work with uh, and in different parts of the world uh, are, are in an existential crisis that is caused by the dysfunctional way of, of how we live on this planet. And how can we make these existential questions that for many young people, and not just young people, I find myself uh, also running in these questions about, you know, what is the meaning of life in a, in a die, on a dying planet? Um, there's eco-anxiety. People are, um, are, are fearful of the future. How can we create a, a kind of a pedagogy of hope in a culture of fear and polarization? How can we bridge and bond? And this has to do also with this more ecological perspective that Mario talked about, this ecology of knowledges where, where boundary crossing, a more relational way of, 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 of learning, where we have kind of a living curriculum around, uh, you know, the places that we inhabit have so many questions around uh, around equality, around health, around climate, around biodiversity, around water, energy, that all converge around these central issues on, on how do we connect, how do we relate, what is the moral compass that guides us in what we do. Those kinds of questions are essential and I do see pockets of hope and change and transitions and how can we coagulate, how can we create synergies between them and how can we also as a university support these kinds of niches and movements. Let's, let me end with that. 
Thank you, Arjen, for these words of, of hope and um, some direction forwards. Um, I'm now very happy to hand it over to Cornelius Hacking, uh, Senior Policy Advisor at the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, Cornelius, please keep it relatively short so that we also have a few minutes left to engage with the audience and let Mario speak. And I hope your sound is working. Yes, thank you, Mike. Good, it I, is. I, I, hope, I hope you can hear me now. Hear yes. Me now. And, yeah. and the, I hear a bit of an echo, but anyway. Um, I'm so sorry that I had this technical glitch, so that that you didn't. I, I, so I didn't know. It's just the last minutes of Ayan's uh, speech. I heard that, but the rest I didn't. I'm very sorry about that. Um, so what I what I want to talk about you. I'm not an, an academic. I'm a development practitioner, education policy advisor to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, for Foreign Trade and Development Cooperation, I should say. So there's a different perspective on the issue, and I'm so sorry I did not hear your um, your speeches. Um, what, I, what I do want to say is that, you know, COVID-19 has shown us the effects of having 1.5 billion children at one point out of school, um, and they lacked uh, getting face-to-face -face education uh, because of COVID-19, and which has led to more education in inequality uh, even. Um, I heard uh, Arjan just saying about uh, about future opportunities, and I think COVID-19 is an opportunity to change uh, systems, to change uh, school systems, education systems, school management, new ways of teaching uh, or, and learning. Um, so I also can incite the debate again on funding and, and funding mechanisms. Um, that is, how should I say, I, I, I've, of course, I know Mario's work, and I went through uh, through some of Ian's work, and my reaction would be putting it in a few dilemmas. Um, you know, indeed, development cooperation is part of a government uh, foreign policy, so it is political by by nature, I would almost say. Um, and only once every four years, we have the opportunity to, to change these policies and to change um, uh, governments. So next March, we can choose again. Um, um, it also has meant that education, for instance, in a Dutch development cooperation has been absent for some 10 years. And Minister Kaag has brought it back in her in her policies. Uh, but still, it's very modest, very small. It's it's two, three percent of the Dutch ODA only. And if you would count the support we give in education to children of refugees, it's a perhaps it's perhaps four um, percent. I won't go into details of the programs that we support, um, but of course also um, indirectly we support education through the World Bank programs, and I assume lots have been said about that uh, by Mario and, and, and colleagues, uh, UNESCO, UNICEF, UNICEF, the EU which we can influence only indirectly. Um, so the influence of, of us as policy advisors and of a Dutch government, by the way, is limited. It's not as big as we think it is. Um, I assume Mario has said something about, you know, the, the one size, size fits all approach of not being the right one. And that is true indeed, uh, but we do deal with with national independent governments. And we try to respect their wishes, their preferences, their culture, their context. And um, I've often participated in, in meetings with government, of, uh, with civil servants like myself, um, you know, trying not to be colonial in a way and waving the person saying that who pays, who determines the programs. But it, I've also noticed that it's often us, the donors, that um, that ask governments to focus on minorities, on girls' education, uh, on the link to work, on environmental issues in a curriculum, etc. So it's not it's not the government. Um, I also the other dilemma is the the balance between uh, education or primary and higher education. Um, the higher education by nature almost serves the five or even less percent, the richest one of a country. And our focus is on basic education. Um, and we feel that all children should have the opportunity to go to school. 
um, and, and even if you go to university, you have to be able to read and write and to have a basic, you have to basic skills, otherwise you can't, you can't do that. So, you know, I could, I could only go longer, but uh, I will keep it very short. I would love to have and see more influence of academics uh, on development policy, on our education policy, uh, instead of do, having that done by, by uh, consultants. Um, but ultimately, it's, I work in the political reality and politicians make the final choice. Um, so uh, education is like myself, give advice. Of course, that's not always followed up as we would like to. So I would love to keep it there and open the floor for questions or discussion. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much for Cornelius. Um, Mario, I will give you um, just a, a few minutes to maybe provide some initial responses. And then afterwards, I'm also going to bring in some of the questions from the audience um, from the chat. So we will likely take a few minutes um, longer uh, after uh, after the full hour. Um, we will probably run over about five minutes. I hope that's uh, that's okay for everyone. Mario, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the comments are so rich and I can't really do that justice in just a few minutes, but I'll pick up on a couple of things. I think Fiona made some interesting reflections around what constitutes the field of education and uh, and, and I do think that um, she raised a really important thing around, you know, education shouldn't be just reduced to schooling. It should be a much broader conceptualization around knowledge and knowledge production and, you know, precisely the kind of work that TNI, War on Want and others do in building the capacity of activists to understand the nature of global reality and the challenges and the issues is part of that education, that kind of popular education tradition. Um, and, you know, in these dispute mechanisms, I think that education uh, will open up one of those uh, areas in the future around uh, low fee private schools, Omega, Bridge Academies, there are a whole range of these corporations that are um, spreading their tentacles around the world and turning uh, a profit uh, through the provision of basic education uh, in many countries. Um, so I think that will be an interesting area. Um, and, you know, as, as, as Fiona reflected, I think there are a number of themes that we could go much deeper into, uh, gender being one in this period, both you know, in, in many of the ways that you talked about already, Fiona, in terms of the, the gendered nature of the impact of COVID on education, on labour, uh, on domestic work in the house and school tutoring and things like that. But also the nature of the way the West has used gender in a very particular way and included certain types of gender and not others. So, you know, for example, we could look at the way that gender was mobilized in the justifications and legitimation of occupation in Afghanistan, uh, the way that um, uh, different types of being a woman uh, are marginalized and a particular type of gender is constructed. Um, and I think that the uh, the international development uh, field is very good at, uh, at, at drawing on that kind of uh, discussion. Um, and I think that, you know, more, more broadly, which is something that Cornelius uh, has pick, picked up on, I think the, the, the question of power in international development assistance is not just about who is paying the money, it's also about mindsets, isn't it? It's also about the fact that you, 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 you make the case that national governments uh, don't want to address these issues, national governments, reflects the way that knowledge is produced in certain, in, in certain institutions, Western institutions that these leaders often get uh, educated in. Um, so I think that, you know, we all need that process of re-education or un-education um, that I think Aryan uh, very eloquently put in his talk around the need really to radically rethink what kind of things we need to learn and how that we can do that. And I definitely think that we could all do with a kind of recognition of the richness and diversity of knowledge, ways of being, ways of knowing that exists in the world and start to move towards that process of a more 
ecology of knowledges approach, which uh, Boaventura de Sousa Santos, the Portuguese uh, philosopher and activist, has argued for, um, which perhaps can can show us different ways of of our own relationship with planet with the planet. And you know, I think that it's those processes of kind of um, thinking about a different type of development uh, that we need. Uh, to work towards in the future. Mario, um, so I'm going to try and summarize some of the conversations that are happening on the chat and bringing some of these questions into the conversation here. Um, Jasmine Gorgi and Jurita Gupta are raising issues about um, the decolonization of development. How do we then decolonize um, the field of development and development studies? And um, the discourses and practices of development being um, a non-profit industrial complex. So maybe it's not only about decolonizing development, but also finding alternatives from the South and the North, like uh, when we be it from the Latin American context or um, post-development, as was also mentioned uh, by Fiona. Another um, comment or question from Riki Okimura um, in regard to the fact that education is industry, how should we position us scholars in higher education who are paid by such an industry yet are problem um, yet are to problematize such commodification of education? It's sort of a contradictory uh, ambivalent position. And two more um, points I want to bring in, one by Naomi Kellogg, within the context of sustainability, can any of you share a bit more about how to push for an educational, uh, how to push for educational digitization, but how this may run counter to climate goals? Um, so this relates to some of the conversations that came up in terms of the current situation that we find ourselves in. Um, and uh, a comment by our colleague Jordan Naidu, how do we avoid getting caught up in the development speak and rhetoric, even as we propose alternative discourses? Because we've seen this with many concepts from gender equality and empowerment to participation becoming buzzwords and similarly with the SDGs. So no minor questions, really rich questions. And um, I'm mindful of time, but I would like to give all of the, the speakers uh, just a minute to uh, reflect on any of these questions that you would like to uh, focus on. Um, Cornelius, can I please start with uh, giving the floor to you? Please go ahead, Cornelius. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. You know, using the passwords, yes, that's true. And we civil servants are very good at doing that. Um, but we like to be fed more by academics. And that's another dilemma that that uh, that we have. We do not know very well how to connect the two. If you like researchers, at least most of you, and and uh, working in, in the academic world, how can you connect better and more to to our speak of the policymakers, of the politicians, um, and then I don't know design a system to. Get Easy one because we do work with uh, the World Bank and other major institutions uh, who use the same development speak. Um, that and so we are confronted with 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 a given and don't have sufficient input. I feel um, because also when we don't have like a government, if we don't have our own development programs in education, still we co-finance uh, the World Bank and, and many other institutions, but you don't have the capacity or people to influence that with new speak, with research, with, you know, uh, countering arguments, etc. So even if a government, a progressive government would want to do that, it needs, it needs tools or words, not the best words, but others having more meaning to counter that speak of of big organizations and of the world bank who below to us by the way because we are the world bank we are on the board so we do have mm -hmm. a voice so i do i do call on academics to to make that link with us much stronger 
how difficult and practical it might be, but I think there's a big need for that. Thank you, Cornelius. So that calls for this bridging and connecting that I think Aryan was also referring to, but then specifically between academia and the policy world. Um, Aryan, may I give the floor to you, please? Sorry, you're unmuted. Yes, please go ahead. I, I, you know, I, I think we need to, to kind of move away uh, from the maybe more transmissive ways of learning and, and spoon feeding information. We need to go towards a more more co-creative way of, of teaching, learning and doing research where we as university people, and I'm part of that community, needs to be very critical of how, how we ourselves have been co-opted and commodified uh, by playing the, the publication game and, and going for the, the impact factors in journals and supporting these big multinational companies, uh, not only by using these platforms that we are on right now, uh, which COVID has really helped expand uh, and has helped uh, the happy few who have loads of money grow their uh, assets even more. But that's another story. I think, you know, when we, we, we need to move away from what I would call research as mining, to research as co-learning, uh, recognizing multiple ways of knowing and multiple local knowledge, experiential knowledge, indigenous knowledge, all are important, including scientific knowledge, where we need to work much more closely in these niches, in these trenches, in these pockets of change to regain trust also from the public, because as, as our higher education system is commodified, we also lose trust in, in the public and we lose maybe public financing even eventually becoming totally dependent upon private uh, financing. That's a huge problem, of course. It's been flagged already. So I think it's really critical that uh, we start moving towards research as activism maybe even. We are in a very urgent planetary crisis um, and, and the COVID is just a, a manifestation of that. And, and then we have the climate urgency and then we have the biodiversity collapse. These are huge. And um, if we do not, are, if we're not willing to radically question what is higher education strengthening in our society and what is it weakening, denying or neglecting in society, then we run the risk of, as David Orr powerfully says, of becoming more, more effective vandals of the earth. And that I think is something really to think about. What is it that we are strengthening and what is it that we are silencing willingly or unwillingly. So critical thinking, but also joining these more emancipatory spaces that are not so much trying to change people's ways of thinking or acting, but creating environments that invite diversity, that invite questioning, that invite creativity, that invite um, compassion and empathy. Creating those kinds of spaces is critical. And that has to do with rethinking about uh, rethinking education. And I agree fully with Fiona and also with Cornelius that is not the exclusive domain of higher education. In fact, I think in early childhood education, uh, the, we find these spaces already. But as soon as young children enter the system more, they lose that ability to connect, to relate, to interact, to explore the world freely on their own terms. We take that all away and teach them to think in categories, boxes, mm. uh, and, and, and that is actually the, the, in fact, that I think that is one of the key uh, uh, foundations for unsustainability. Mm. And unlearning is, is also indeed very important in that regard. Thank you, Arjen. Fiona, the floor is yours. Um, I'm watching the clock here. <laughs> Um, no, well, I just want to say thank you to everyone for, for a very rich um, set of ideas and inputs and food for thought. Um, Cornelius, I, I, I think that you've got a resource right here in Amsterdam for the ministry. I think CSDS um, is, in fact, uh, trying to construct uh, a more critical look at, um, at new paradigms for development or, or post-development paradigm. So I think, uh, I think there, there's something there that can be further explored. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, about all I'll say. Thank you, Fiona, also for keeping us in time somewhat. Mario, over to you, please. Uh, yeah, uh, also conscious that I have another session in a few minutes. Yes. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's a very important question about alternatives 
alternative development processes that we need to not just look inside ourselves and in our own domains, but actually look uh, for inspiration uh, in many different places. And they can come indeed from the experience in Latin America, when we veer and these new concepts that emerge um, from some of the fallout, even from the Syrian conflict, where we've seen amazing experiments in democracy in Rojava and other places. Uh, um, and so I do think that uh, we need to be a bit more imaginative in terms of the resources that we draw upon to think and rethink the future. Um, and I do think that that leads us to the question of the university, which um, OK, I've left I left Amsterdam in 2010 and I'm in the UK, but I can tell you that in the UK, um, the university is a machine a neoliberal machine, both in terms of the competition for students, but also in terms of research and contracts and consultancy and this kind of thing, which often gives you very little space to breathe. So I do think there is a battle to be fought about the kind of decommodification of the university, mm. to try to protect it as a space of critique, um, uh, to give it some room to breathe, because at the moment it feels very much that in order for academics to survive, they need to gather resources. In order to get those resources, they need to get them from governments or corporations or, or agencies. And uh, for that reason, um, there is little space for critique. So I think that, you know, there are battles to rethink the role of the university uh in this um process but you know there is no doubt that um you know this discussion could go on in many different directions and i hope it will and uh, you know thank you to all of the discussants for for providing some really interesting responses thank you mario so we'll close this session with some keywords of co-creation new ways of imagining rethinking the way we engage as academics, academic activists, engage with policymakers, with communities, pluralities of knowledges. I hope this plenary kicks us off um, with lots of new ideas and critical ways of engaging. And we would like to thank the speakers. We have planted 17 trees, one for every SDG. So these are our presents to you as speakers and contributors. Um, I hope that is welcome. And uh, thank you also to the audience for your engaging conversation on the chat. We hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank Goodbye, everyone. Much. Thank you. Goodbye.